thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, invitation. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you today. Uh, some uh, names that I recognize, some um, uh, new names that I have not encountered before. It's really nice to be amongst colleagues, new and, and old in this space. It would be nicer if it was, of course, um, face to face. But uh, thank you so much to the organizers for putting on this wonderful series of events. Um, and thank you for inviting me. So. Um, what I want to do today um, is something that I is different from what I usually do. Usually, I would bring to you ethnographic findings and 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 share interesting quotes from participants and anecdotes from ethnography. But today, I, I did something different. I, for the past few months, I have been getting annoyed, worried, frustrated at certain aspects of contemporary feminist debates. And so I literally sat down and I just spilled all my thoughts onto paper and I'm going to share those thoughts with you today. So apologies in advance if they feel disorganized and underdeveloped because this is basically me drawing on my ethnographic data, of course, but trying to articulate something that I've been thinking about, but that I'm only now beginning to put into paper. And so, as I say, I'm delighted to be here today because as because as you can imagine, I share with all of you the desire, which is very clearly centered in the title of this session, to dismantle knowledge asymmetries and power relations in gender studies. And I want to start uh, my contribution to our discussion about this dismantling from a very simple point that I think is pretty uncontroversial, which is that in order for us to dismantle asymmetries and power relations in gender studies, I think we need to understand the asymmetries and power relations in gender studies and, and how they play out in neoliberal universities. Now, this is, should, it, it appears as something quite straightforward, right? All of us, we are living these asymmetries and these inequalities every day as we study and work in contemporary universities. We discuss this formally and informally. So we should know all about these asymmetries and these power relations, right? Because we're so embedded in them and we're actors in them in all sorts of ways. And that's where I think my uncontroversial point slowly maybe becomes a little bit more controversial. And and what I want to highlight today is that I think um, knowledge asymmetries and power relations in neoliberal universities are exceptionally complex. I would argue that they are much more complex and messy than maybe the sorts of asymmetries and power relations that many of us would have found in previous academic systems that many of us still inhabit. Uh, certainly in Portugal, where I'm from, I've argued that we have a system that is still feudal if you want to call it that, that and neoliberal at the same time. Um, but I would say that neoliberal academic cultures, they've got very complex asymmetries and power relations. And so the power relations that we inhabit now in gender studies are exceptionally complex. And I want to suggest that although as feminists, we have very good theories of power, very different theories of power at our disposal, uh, at our disposal to understand power, I think we have actually, and this is where I'm getting a little bit controversial, I don't think we've been very good at the, having conversations about power that uh, recognize complexity fully and that work with that complexity, including complexities that have to do with the disconnect between the way that we intellectual, that the intellectually and politically relate to power and the ways in which affectively, psychoanalytically, emotionally, we uh, deal with power. Uh, and, and I want to talk about that precisely today. The things that I think are messy, things that I think we're entangled in that I don't think we've been very good in recent years, at least in these spaces that I've inhabited. I don't think we've been very good at making sense of them and talking about them. So today, as part of my frustration with uh, those debates that I've seen, I want to make a case for complexity. And I want to make a plea for us to develop um, different ways or maybe <laughs> some uh, some some of the same ways, but articulated uh, uh, differently, um, of talking about power, of thinking about power, ways that better recognize, as I was saying earlier, the messy threads that we're all entangled in, 
ways that better recognize our ambivalent investments, uh, ways that better um, uh, recognize the very perverse pleasures, I'm using here a term from Valerie Hay, the perverse pleasures that we get from working within and against those asymmetries and power relations. And to do this, I'm going to offer a, a talk in two parts. So basically, I'm, I'll first tell you a little bit about my uh, ethnography of academia that says to me is an inspira theoretical inspiration, but also a life lesson in making sense of uh, some of these complexities. And then I'll talk more generally about what I see as the challenges and how we speak about this in contemporary feminist debates. But before I continue, I've had a look and there's people, if I can make assumptions from names, which I shouldn't, but if I make assumptions from people's names, I can see that we have here colleagues from uh, all sorts of academic systems and, and regions. And, and what I say might, will certainly not apply to all those contexts and regions. And that's something that I think I, I would certainly welcome having a discussion about, because I think the way that these asymmetries play out and the way that we talk about them really uh, vary uh, from context to context. So let me start with that first part of telling you a little bit about my ethnography um, of academia that has inspired many of my uh, ideas today. So several years ago, I uh, decided uh, to, um, well, because in, in my experience as a student in Portugal, where I'm from, I'd encountered so many situations where feminist scholarship, queer scholarship was openly dismissed as not quite proper knowledge, uh, either because it was too uh, specific, too, um, uh, uh, too emotional, too political, too ideological. It wasn't quite proper knowledge. I was very interested uh, in developing a research project that would analyze, okay, so how do academics decide what counts as proper knowledge? How do they negotiate that? And how does feminist scholarship get positioned in relation to those boundaries? So when I started the project, it was a project all about these people, uh, feminist scholars, queer scholars, they are oppressed, marginalized by these exclusionary understandings of proper knowledge. And I want to, you know, to uh, address this marginality and and sort of advocate uh, uh, advocate for them, advocate for my participants. And I started doing the project. I did uh, a lot of field work at one point in time, and then I returned to the field seven years later to be able to do the longitudinal ethnography. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the details. If you want, there's more details in this book, but don't buy it or spend money on it. I'll put a link in the chat where you can get it for free. Um, uh, and, and what I find in this book is that, uh, yes, basically in a nutshell, is yes, there are many ways, many sexist, uh, um, homophobic ways in which uh, uh, feminist scholarship, queer scholarship gets positioned as lesser knowledge. But I found that actually the institutionalization in the Portuguese context where I did the ethnography of neoliberal um, cultures of uh, organization of academic labor, cultures that I called performative academic cultures focused on producing, performing in particular ways. They were actually changing the situation because feminists and queer scholars that for a long time had been dismissed because they didn't produce proper knowledge were suddenly finding openings in academia as long as they were highly uh, uh, highly achieving. If they produced a lot, if they got money, if they got funds, suddenly universities didn't mind anymore if you were feminist or queer as long as, in the, word, in the words of one of my participants, you produce and keep producing. And I analyzed the complexities of this. And as I say, at the time, I did this project because I was horrified at what I had experienced and others had experienced. People had been excluded, discriminated, uh, harassed in Portuguese academia, and the experiences of trauma, of marginality were real and they were horrible. But as I started doing the ethnographic fieldwork, I encountered horrible experiences of marginalization, but I also encountered other things. You know, I encountered situations where um, uh, people seem to be invested in marginality. So I am the only feminist scholarship that does this. There was something special about being marginal, um, uh, uh, somehow being, you know, a minority. I encountered people um, 
oppressing others on the basis of marginality. So, for example, look, our field is not taken seriously. So please don't go and do something that is too queer, that is too radical, because otherwise it will affect the field. So marginality was real and it was a, clearly an experience of, of of silencing and of, of blockage, but it also led to dynamics where those who were marginalized by mainstream academic cultures were also then silencing others, excluding others in interesting, complex ways. And so I started to 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 pay attention to this. You know, th yes, these uh, feminist scholars, queer scholars, they are ma marginalized by neoliberal academia, but also they become, many of them, all of us, become invested in being recognized, become invested in being cited. And so um, they, sometimes they would become even more performative, produce even more than other people, because if I am at risk of being disqualified because I'm a feminist and the way that I can get a job or I can get recognition is by being very productive, then let me produce a lot and get more funding. So suddenly I was noticing forms of compliance, over compliance that to me didn't I didn't see as happening because these people are bad feminists or liberal feminists or complicit feminists, but it was precisely because marginalization created concerns, worries, investments that led people to um, relate to norms and authority in complex ways. And it reminded me here of a, a, a quote that I really like from a piece by Paul Gilroy, where Paul Gilroy talks about how um, neoliberalism is seductive for many black individuals and black communities. And he says, and I quote, the history of being denied recognition as an individual has actually enhanced among black communities the, the appeal of particular varieties of extreme individualism. And I was noticing the same effect. It's precisely because many of these scholars had been denied and were denied recognition and authority as scholars that they sometimes became very invested in getting authority, getting recognition, being the, not just an expert, but being the expert on something. So I was struggling to make sense of these experiences because, I, as I say, I think our theories don't always allow us to articulate the ways in which marginality is entangled in um, oppression, if you want to use these particular words. And there's um, a, a quote from Louise Morley that I really like. Louise Morley says that it's important to avoid depicting feminists in the academy as micro-political martyrs, Christ-like figures being tested um, uh, by adversity to rise triumphantly at the end. And she says that this reifies power relations by reinforcing a reductive victim oppressor binary. And that's exactly what I was feeling as well. I I didn't want to reinforce this victim oppressor binary because I that's not what I was seeing in my ethnography. I started out looking for victims and oppressors and then suddenly notice how the victims, if we want to use that language, I don't particularly like it, precisely because they're victimized, become invested in forms of oppression and relations of oppression. And in those moments, marginality is not separate from authority. And so uh, let me just check how much time I have. Um, so I started thinking about this and I started thinking about, OK, so if we if we look at marginality, not just as constrained, but also as something that is entangled in power, how do our feminist debates look different? And just to give you one example, um, uh, one area that I became very interested in is the debates that we have in feminist scholarship about transnational power relations in gender studies. And Chavonka uh, writes that, um, that the pa power relations within women's and gender studies in a global area are very, very complex. And, and I, like Trevonka, think we do, haven't been very good at showcasing that complexity because in many texts that you find on transnational hierarchies within gender studies, there is a focus, as there should be, on the hegemony of Anglophone countries uh, or the hegemony of the global north over the global south. But that hegemony is tends to be framed primarily or only as a form of loss or constraint. So these people in the global north or these people in Anglophone countries, they take up all the space and there is no space left over for others or less space left over for others. So 
what was the focus on what was being repressed by that hegemony, what was being made invisible by that hegemony, what was being excluded through that hegemony. But in my ethnography, I was noticing other things. I was noticing that sometimes Portuguese scholars would really use strategically, agentically, the hegemony of some of these countries uh, in their own uh, fights for authority. So they might say, for example, oh, look, you managers of my Portuguese university, you think feminist scholarship isn't um, good, but look, in the US and in the UK, they support feminist scholarship. And we think the UK and the US produces better knowledge, so therefore, feminist scholarship must be valuable. So actually, that transnational hegemony, which produces many closures in transnational circulations of knowledge, locally was producing openings because suddenly managers would take things more seriously because if the UK and the US do this, then we should do it too. So I became very interested in seeing how transnational hegemonies, yes, produce closures, but they also make certain things possible in a, in a local context in very complex ways. So I was trying to make sense of all of this and I start to move on now to contemporary debates. And I was trained as a post-structuralist feminist and I was inspired and indeed supervised by people like um, Claire Hemmings who make a case for us to analyze the stories we tell about feminism. And so I was trying to see as a, the post-structuralist feminist I was trained to be, trying to see power as repressive, yes, but also as generative, if we frame this in Foucauldian terms. And I started to get very interested in, as I was saying earlier, the stuff that we we are invested in unconsciously, the stuff that we are invested in perversely, our ambivalent relationship to, to power. And I was noticing in my participants, in my friends, in my colleagues, in myself, that there are many pains of being subjected to sexism, racism, homophobia. There is no doubt about it. This is painful, painful stuff. But there's also some pleasures there. I saw many moments in conferences in my own life where people share stories of microaggressions, share stories of this horrible sexism, racism that they witnessed. And in the moment, if you observe the interactions, there is anger being expressed and pain and sadness and, and trauma, but there's also some other powerful affects, some pleasurable affects going on. People, when they narrate the, uh, the marginalization that they've experienced and others uh, uh, listen to that and validate that, there is a sense of recognition, of solidarity, of community. And there's a sense of, look, look how much sexism there is in the world. So we are right to be feminists. It, it justifies the work that we do. The more sexism we encounter, yes, the more draining our work is, but also the more we are vindicated in the need and the desire and the commitment to study um, sexism as well as racism and other things. So in a sense, I would argue, at least that's what happens to me, may not happen to all of you, um, but many authors say that this happens in, in many ways, that we hate these experiences, but they also feed us in complex ways, right? We are com perversely entangled in them. And many people have talked about this in different ways. Pete Meyer, for example, talks about uh, narratives of besiegement in uh, gender studies. She talks about how uh, many feminist scholars talk about gender studies as being besieged under attack. And in many countries at the moment, we are in fact under attack materially, objectively, and I, I'm not disputing that. Um, but what Bittmeyer says is that that besiegement narrative sometimes also serves in complex ways to, um, to make intellectual claims, generational claims. And also she says it works as a form of absolution. We are under attack, so I can, I am justified to do certain things, or that somehow creates the need for our existence. So there are forms here of, of absolution and authority that play into this in complex ways. And I notice in my own fieldwork that when we argue that gender studies is marginalized or that black feminism is marginalized, uh, that can function also as a basis for us to demarcate our own epistemic status. I am the right person to be doing intersectionality and you are not because intersectionality is under attack from white feminists, for example, 
or I am the I am doing the right kind of feminist or queer scholarship uh, and, and you are not. And as I say, these are ideas that many have articulated. I've been very inspired more recently by the work of US black feminist Jennifer Nash, uh, whose fascinating book Black Feminism Reimagined um, argues that American black feminist scholars uh, relate to a black feminist theorizing and especially to the concept of intersectionality through a mode of defensiveness that Nash queries and problematizes. So she says that in, uh, that uh, there's the narrative that intersectionality must be defended and that we are the ones to defend it, whoever the we is, um, creates what she describes as a form of p uh, political libido, right? It, 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 it stokes passions and desires by representing, and I quote, intersectionality under siege and rendered vulnerable by its critics or by the people who appropriated and ultimately salvaged, saved by the heroic labor of black feminists themselves. And she talks about how this is at once wonderful and, and generative, but also problematic because it means black feminists then become stuck in a mode of defending uh, rather than creating, justifying rather than uh, imagining. And, uh, and always writing in relation to white feminists in ways that continue to center white feminists. And Jen Nash also talks about how this performs authority. We are the saviors of intersectionality, but also absolution. Uh, I am the right kind of feminist. So to wrap up now, because I'm running out of time, um, I'm drawing on these authors and telling you the story of how my project changed from wanting to look at victims who were marginalized by neoliberal academia to asking how we are entangled in the relationships of authority and the power hierarchies that we exist in. Because as I was saying earlier, I've been thinking about this a lot at various events I've been to recently. I don't know if this is the case in the events you've been attending, but in the events I've been attending, I've been seeing a shift in theorizing from seeing power as something that is complex, that works in systemic structures, to power that is displaced to particular groups. Particular groups have power, and other groups disavow power, displace the power. The power is over there in those kinds of people, not in my kind of people. So power stops being something that is complex, a systemic structure, and is displaced to other groups, often in ways that are quite binary. Complicit feminists, ally feminists, good feminists, bad feminists, white feminists, black feminists, oppressed and uh, oppressor. And these ways of speaking are also often very essentialist. And indeed, many black feminists have argued that they sort of create a, a, a sense that all black feminists think the same thing because they are black feminists, when in fact there is great diversity of thinking. So there's a, a displacing of attention also onto individuals. So it's very individualizing understandings of power and that look quite intersectional, but actually they foreclose the direction and meaning of intersectionality in very essentialist ways. So immigrant women are always marginal, even if they're upper class, or black women are always marginal, even if they are professors or they are American or they have uh, or they're highly cited and very famous, right? So uh, uh, we the, we only look at certain forms of intersectionality and prescribe those and foreclose them. And I think we're doing this at the expense of something that I think is important. And I wrapping up. I'm wrapping up now. I'm inspired here by a recent talk that I lis listened to by Finnish scholar of trans history Julian Honkasalo, um, who uh, was arguing that this focus on who we are as individuals and as groups in these rigid relations of power actually comes at the expense of being able to understand structures and, and systems of power. And I would add that it, it comes at the expense of recognizing our own contingent positionalities within them. I could tell a story about myself that only highlights my marginality. I'm immigrant and I'm this and that and the other. Uh, but I could also say, you know, that I am uh, heterosexual and, and white and, um, and all sorts of other things, right? So our contingent positionalities get lost in this. But also what I think is lost and what I really ardently, passionately desire, but maybe that's just me, is 
conversations that can be maybe a little bit more honest and complex about how we are all perversely invested in the seductions of neoliberal authority. We are all perversely in entangled in these power relations. It's not just some of us, it's all of us. Some of us may be structurally privileged and so that we don't have to confront that, but all of us are perversely entangled, seduced by invested in. At least that's maybe the controversial case I'm making. So I want to make a case that we focus on entanglement, especially when we study academia. Academia has many inequalities, but we're all a bunch of people who write because we want to be cited, because we want to be recognized, because we want to have some kind of authority as a scholar. So to, we may be using that authority to decolonize. We may be using that authority to queer, but we are invested in that authority nonetheless. And I think we need to recognize that, especially because as Paul Gilroy says, those of us who have been denied that more are often the ones with more complex, you know, tense, uncontrollable, unconscious investments in that authority. So uh, I think it's really important to have these complex open conversations. We cannot just continue disavowing power, displacing power onto those other feminists, those other people. I think we have to have a more reflexive recognition of our own complex desires and our own complex relationships with power. And I think it's only then when we recognize not just the pains of marginality, but also the pleasures that we get from marginality. That's when I think we can fully properly dismantle these asymmetries and these power relations. Thank you. And thank you, Maria, for this great presentation and the, the passion you, you have in it, it was really inspiring. Uh, my perspective uh, is, so to speak, which I have here is you, you bring into the debate much more this what I would call micro perspectives, what what motivates us, what makes us and and the power which is which is really great. I will focus here much more on what can be t uh, called storytelling and transnational hierarchies and before my I will focus on the asymmetries that shape the production and circulation of knowledge within gender studies um, and between and the velvet border uh, in European gender studies three decades after the fall of the Iron Curtain and um, we can say while this edgy east-west divide uh, has been refined uh, within a field which is now established as transnational European. We still have a West centric, centric skew uh, that per permits feminist knowledge production within a geopolitical space in which the positionality of Eastern Europe is transmuted from the second world to the second other of Europe. Uh, after 89, a new taxonomy of feminist knowledge emanated from processes in which the canonization and professionalization of gender studies, uh, theoretical upheavals and geopolitics became intrigues inextricably linked. Sorry for <laughs> the English is, I, okay. At the core of the proposed argument is a profound rethinking of time-space relations through the embeddement of East-West demarcation in a broader perspective of historical and contemporary global entanglements. This enables us to problematize epistemic categories that imprudently reproduce asymmetries. Um, I have a biographical background in Poland, but I'm socializing West Germany and my research focused, as has been mentioned uh, for many years on comparative gender studies and welfare policies in Sweden and Germany. When I also began doing research about Poland, which coincided with taking a position at the Swedish university, I started to realize the asymmetric order, which I did not see before, of keynote speakers from being from the West, scholars from the East, relegated to a few clearly marked panels, whereas they were absent in the general theoretical panels. So my entry point to knowledge asymmetries um, with regard to the other Europe was the attempt to make sense of these asymmetries and of this legendary also East-West debate in women and gender studies. 
uh, which actually took place in the 90s, but in certain ways also continues. A starting point was a conference uh, under the title, Why is there no happiness in the East? <laughs> um, the making of European gender studies, uh, and which finally led to the publication of a book which has been mentioned here, Borderlands European Gender Studies Beyond the East-West Frontier. To be sure, the East-West distinction within Europe is both long-standing and highly fluid and contested. It is, rather than a fixed division, represents a meta-geography, a spatial and mental structure through which people order their knowledge of the world. As Manuela Boatka convincingly argues, the division ought to be conceived as embedded within the colonial and imperial designs that shaped the emergence of the modern world system. The hierarchization within Europe was solidified according to spatial configurations between imperial centers and peripheries in the 19th centuries, and mental maps of Easterners were linked to the Orientalism intrinsic to further European colonial expansion. From that time on, Eastern Europe and the Balkans were placed between Occident and Orient. In the geopolitical imaginary, the border, these borderlands functioned not as Europeans other in terms of a binary qualitative alterity, but rather as Western Europe's incomplete self, employing mechanism of quantitative inferiorization. They were rated on a scale of Europeanness, underlaid with ethnic racializing categories of Slavicness, semi-developed, semi-civilized, semi-oriental. Characteristic of the Eastern European positionality is the ambiguity and lack of clarity of being at once part of Europe and outside Europe. The meta perspective employed here entails an examination of the European East-West divide from a global, as I already mentioned, transnational perspective. For not only was the second world largely absent from the horizon of transnational feminist theorizing, but also the connection between the second and third world also be became a peculiar void after the fall of the wall. A critical retrospection of the field's formation from a geopolitical perspective profoundly challenges the hegemonic constructs of transnational feminist theorizing according to the binary of Western and third world feminism. The retro retrospective rephrasing, a term I borrow from Stuart Hall, of academic and transnational feminist genealogies aims to provincialize the story of Western academic feminism. The retrospective rephrasing helped me not only to understand the asymmetrical relations of the East-West divide in the European women's and gender studies, but how much the hegemonic storylines and the linear temporality rest on erasure and oblivion. I advocate a reorientation of analytical vision toward a horizon that explores interrelations as well as the localization of non-Western Europe in a global and historical perspective. Um, I call it a post-three world epistemic cartography. The dissolution of the bipolar world shifted the guiding axis from that of Eastern and Western blocks to that of global North and global South. With regard to geopolitics at large, but also with regard to feminist theorizing. The second world and state socialism exchange its status as a political economic entity and a space of mirroring what was longed for might be over there. This was compellingly told in Audre Lorde's notes from a trip to Russia published in Sister Outsider, which is largely ignored in today's reading of Sister Outsider, for that of a gray zone of Eastern Europe and the Balkans, whose positionality is difficult to conceive and tends to be carved out in a cartography of absences. From a global perspective, the territory is added to the global north. It can glibly be tacked onto the west and the rest, also popping up as part of the former socialist west, as Claire Hennings has called it, which is <laughs> somewhat ironic. At the UN World Conference held in Beijing in 95, this experience was the topic of the statement from a known region 
scholars writing about the conceptual and institutional foundations of the field of women and gender studies name, name the Butler moment, the time around 89, as a crucial turning point in the tra transition to cultural ling linguistic modes of analysis, as well as to the diversification of the fundamental category, which was no longer women, but differences. By contrast, the, st the end of state socialism is never mentioned in these works. The fundamental transformation of the field of possibilities of articulation of theory in the context of a new world order is not reflected upon. Neither the Second World nor post-socialism figures among the key words in any of the chapters of the Oxford Handbook of Family Theory, edited by Mary Hawkesworth and Dish, 2016. This is also the case in the Oxford Handbook of Transnational Feminist Movements, edited by Baksh and Harcourt. The entire volume is virtually void of references to works authored by scholars from the region. The chapter that aspires to outline a critical cartography of transnational feminism mentions the debate about the missing second world perspective and refers to a single article by, you may guess, a US scholar. Um, I will give you some examples about this kind of hegemonic storylines and I, I would try to, to be in time. I hope I will finish it at five o'clock so that we can go to break them. Uh, we can say that hegemonic storylines rest on erasure and oblivion. And the con a concrete story here is uh, how the, the, the UN human rights as women's rights, the concept of, and policy frame is represented through a Western narrative as a move from you all know the frame from global sisterhood to transnational feminism, from an essentialist notion that ignored difference to transnational, where the Beijing conference is regarded as a crucial boundary and origin. I will tell you a little bit a different story. During the Cold War, the antagonism on the stage of um, international politics in the United Nations Questions of gender equality were a central focus of struggle among competing concepts of human rights between what was called anti imperial and colonialist blocs in the 60s and 70s. So, for instance, the inclusion of the non discrimination clauses in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 48, as well as the passage of the Declaration on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in 1967 were due in large part to the lobbying of communist states in coalition with the non-aligned countries, the, the then decolonized countries. The Western narrative is, for, for instance, by Ali Tripp and others, th that the commission was dominated by members from Western countries, which is what, which it was not. Tripp fails to cite the conflicts of the competing norms that had been roiling since the 60s, as well as the controversies in the UN decade of women. Only as if in 1985, she suggests, did the South begin to challenge the ideological dominance of the North. Why the UN conference in Mexico in 75 was assumingly characterized by Western dominance. Here, progress narrative is employed, whose happy end is the 90s concept of women's rights as human rights. This storyline creates a Western interpretative authority that did not exist as such at the time. In fact, the final declaration of Mexico was passed with several reservations among Western countries and against the votes of the United States and Israel. The declaration linked women's emancipation to oppression caused by colonialism, neocolonialism, Zionism, Russian discrimination and apartheid. The passionate disagreements in Mexico City and ensuing conf UN conferences are usually omitted from the hegemonic narrative. During the Cold War, there was close cooperation between Second and Third World on international level in the decolonization process. Socialist Yugoslavia, which remained outside the Soviet bloc and co-founded the non-aligned movement, many today know 
that Yugoslavia was the co-founder of the non-aligned movement, which we now call the third world, was the central site for the exchange of ideas on the axis stretching along all three worlds. This prevalent story of international women's mobilization and supranational encounters as a shift from global sisterhood to transnational feminism is a Western one. A hem homogenizing understanding of women's issues and rights was geopolitically contested from the outset. In some, it could be said that the origins of intersectionality are to be found not in American feminist academia, but in international encounters and transnational organizations. Recent scholarship illustrates that the collaboration, collaboration between the second and the non-aligned countries, uh, or the th third world, as we call it, took on an important role in shaping the international women's rights as human rights agenda. Similar stories of, of oblivion can be told about the establishment of academic feminism. Western academic feminism has been usually narrated as an heroic interloper, as Elam and Wiegmann call it, emerging from grassroots activism. The institutionalization of women and gender studies in Western countries was indeed facilitated by transformations in higher education since the 60s, moving towards professional education and a more application-oriented mo mode of scientific knowledge already at that time. In the United States, women's studies were embedded in the Cold War apparatus of ideological warfare with the Soviet Union. Kugenger, study of feminist theory journal par excellence, science, the Journal of Women in Culture and Society, reveals that science was from the time of its inception in 1975, which coincides with the UN conference in Mexico City, linked to both the US State Department and the US Agency for international development and co-founded by corporate philanthropy. The breakdown of state socialism reorganized the matrix of happiness, to use Sarah Ahmed's term, in profound ways. In a certain sense, a restoration of the civilization map of the 16th century was taking place. This was made particularly explicit with the use of the term Europeanization to describe the process of so-called Eastern enlargement of the European Union. In the field of women gender studies too, the constellation was marked by contradictory orientations, where so the processes of professionalization and transnationalization were taking place, epistemological shift, and um, a kind of new geopolitical positioning. The 1991 European Feminist Research Conference held in Alborg, Denmark, under the auspices of European Council was the first conference of its kind forming the so-called Europeanization of gender studies. In the memories of Yugoslav scholars, it was not the gathering in Alborg that provided the funding moment of pan-European academic feminism and the birthplace of Athena, the conferences in Dubrovnik in the 80s, where also Rosie Braidotti, among others, uh, took part. Europeanization made it possible for Western feminist theorizing and activism to position itself as a more advanced and progressive. In this sense, epistemic authority and the growth of institutional power in the context of new funding regimes co-produced one another. One could even argue that Western feminist scholarship only appeared with the fall of the Eastern Bloc. Until then, the preferential vocabulary consisted of political epithets like radical, socialist, liberal, imperialist, black, Chicana, lesbian. Western stands rather for an epistemic and cultural place. It is a deep historical irony that a progress narrative of the formation of the field of feminism itself came into being just as feminist theorizing perched itself from master categories of progress. The perspective moved from one of systems to one of subjectivity and the search for difference proper. The periodization storyline inherent in the progress narrative had a considerable impact on East-West encounters after 89, contributing as it did to the late arrival status of the scholars of Eastern Europe, the perception of late arrival and lagging behind as a kind of wound is still today the most common description 
that scholars from non-Western Europe offer of their own positionality. The establishment of gender studies in the former post-socialist states was highly contested in many ways. The, so was the use of the concept of gender, particularly the English term, disputed as a potential Western intellectual colonization imposed by means of financial programs of exchange. And the term was not used by the government then, but by scholars like Biliana Kashic and others. The institutionalization of women and gender research in post-socialist state um, countries took place not simply later, but under quite distinct conditions of possibility. Post-academic transdisciplinary feminist scholarship was nearly unintellig unintelligible in the context, um, in addition to being problematic to place institutionally. As the Eastern European universities, so to speak, moved back to a Humboldt idea to get um, to lose the politicization of knowledge, which was linked to communism. Under the designation of gender studies in the 90s, however, it was institutionalized with quite great success in these countries, principally with the aid of private international foundations. As a result, gender studies assumed a certain position as foreign interloper, a position that was ambivalent in many ways. The invocation of the foreign and modern, and now I'm quoting Maria, is current in other semi peripheral regions, as Maria has shown. But it had a specific shade of meaning in the post socialist realm. Okay. I um, can. What I wonder, I have two pages more, and this is like on the, these affinities between the post, the post-socialist and the post-colonial. I can continue, but I, we can also stop here and take on the discussion if you want. Um, I will go over time. I think it is really interesting your thoughts, so for me it's uh, okay if you continue. <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, few dispute today that feminist theorizing has moved beyond the cultural term. Taxonomies, as has been mentioned here before, are being reworked anew with the new societal configurations of power characterized by highly contradictory constellations. And I really agree with Maria here. In a sophisticated essay, Stuart Hall located the postcolonial field in the midst of a shift of power knowledge regimes, a still emergent new epistemic information. He argued against the careless homogenizing of the concept and for an attentive assessment of different global dominations as different social formations are certainly not post-colonial in the same way, but this does not mean that they are not post-colonial in any way. So the post-colonial decolonial theoretical framework are primarily oriented towards the West and the rest, whereby Europe is quoted to the West. They have inspired scholars in gender studies, any other disciplines to consider the entanglements and hierarchizations within Europe in new ways. And one of these kind of signs of this hierarchies is that this scholarship, which has been produced in the last, let's say more than 10 years, has largely been ignored in those works who are framed as post-colonial and decolonial. It has changed a little bit in the last years, but this has been dominating the, this, the reception of post-colonial studies, that this is ignored. One of the pitfalls in the debates about the posts, as a post-colonial, post-socialist, is thinking in analogies between post-colonial and post-socialism which also was present in early feminist debates in the 90s. The temporal arri arrival and resonance of the post-decolonial framework has been quite different in the European East. Scholars from former Yugoslavia were among the first who turned to post-colonial criticism, probing the false universalism of West European feminism, as well as the processes of so-called Europeanization. And I would there are several names. Uh, one of those uh, has been, for instance, Marina Blogajevic and Kasic and Grazinic now. They are 
quite quite a few. Um, this might be not really surprising, as due to the status as not being an online country. An emergent field of comparative postcolonial studies in Europe is evidencing how differently the post-decolonial perspectives are incorporated in various nation, national contexts today. The fact that the language of post-decolonial paradigms has detached itself from the world of academia and is to die applied in political struggles, like in Poland, seems to me to be the evidence that the imaginary of the post-colonial resonates with cru crucial questions of our time. Discussions on what qualifies as colonialism concern research beyond post-socialist state and Eastern Europe, in which the classification of the Tsarist Empire and the Soviet Union posed and poses a significant controversial question. This is in turn entangled with the question to uh, to the extent to which cultural foreignness and otherness are valid as defining criteria in colonial sense. Nadina Tostanova emphasizes, for example, that the liberation of the white Catholic Poles from the Russian Soviet yoke is not the same as decolonization in Africa, where the people were coded as absolutely different. She perceives the parallel Homo Sovieticus and the racialized other of Western modernity as inappropriate. Tostanova's criticism is directed at the tendency to analogize between postcolonialism and postcommunism as the same. Today, it can be noted that postcolonial decolonial perspective in research on non-Western Europe is not a project of singularity and sameness and represents in no way a direct transfer but is a translation and bastardization. It is not restricted to the state socialist periods and its legacies. Rather, the horizon has broadened enormously with respect to both time and space. The rewriting of Europe's spatiotemporal temporal geography is embedded within the colonial and imperial designs that shape the emergence of the modern world system, hence also situated within global coloniality enable important insights for the historical hierarchization and ongoing rebordering process with Europe's, within Europe, as Manuela Boatka and others have pointed out. An emergent field of comparative postcolonial studies in Europe is evidencing how differently the post and decolonial perspectives are incorporated in various national contexts. Um, a significant and problematic in this debate is, so to speak, how the question of race and whiteness is, should be debated. Um, in the early debates, it has been said that the category of colonial to the so-called Balkan and Eastern Europe should not be applied because it is not about race. Recent research on Yugoslavia, as well as on German politics in the Eastern areas, queries such unambiguousness. Instead of race in the singular, race is conceived as racialization, as a series of construction in social processes. Anka Pavulescu introduced the concept of racial triangulation to the study of Eastern European migration. In so doing, she acknowledges Deepesh Chakrapadi's reference to the existence of new subalterns in the midst of Europe and how the racialized precariat seems to foreclose alliances and political en um, agency from below. The lines of demarcation that are sometimes drawn between the post-colonial and the decolonial bear disturbing similarities to the rhetorics of distancing that were identified in the progress narrative of feminist storytelling after the paradigmatic shifts of 1989 towards the post in a skeptical interpretation, the decolonial turn can be regarded as part of the academic business of decrying gaps in others presenting one's own research as cutting edge. In an optimistic interpretation, the appeal of the decolonial results from the political impulses it evokes as it connects theorizing to the imaginary of resistance and liberation struggles, which were somehow outdated with the rise of the post prefixes. It indicates that theorizing it finds itself 
beyond the celebratory bias about the implosion of binaries and borders inscribed more or less in the post-colonial. What might be needed, and now I, I am at coming to the end of my presentation, what might be needed in order to understand how the historical hierarchizations and its different layers are linked to the ongoing rebordering within Europe and within the global spatio-temporal horizon is a rethinking of the modality of theorizing, which is actually already taking place. Manuela Boatka called for a creolizing theory. The lesson from the critical meta stories about feminist theorizing is the need for a modality of theorizing that is driven not, and now I again refer to Maria, denouncing gaps, but an academic practice of critique that prioritizes mutual learning and becoming better with because of. Theoretical work is crazy quilting, dirty blending, and creolizing. Thank you for your attention. These these are very, uh, very very big, very important questions, and it's I think it's the sort of question that if you discover the answer to them, then you know. The, uh, our, our work here is done, right? Because uh, these questions are really at the center of of where I think the the complexities are. And um, this first point about the strategies and solidarities is one that you know where my own thinking has, has shifted over time. As you know, I think like many others, like I suspect, like many of you, I become I get quite excited about certain theories or concepts or ideas or strategies as like the solution to all the problems. And then as those ideas or, or strategies become utilized, you start to notice the risks that they generate as well as the possibilities that they offer. And so, so if I can, what, one of the things, one of the things that I have observed my, um, my participants and myself utilize as a strategy for survival in academic systems where our situation as feminist scholars, as queer scholars, as decolonial anti-racist scholars is precarious and it is very precarious and in some contexts under threat. Um, the strategy that my, I've seen my, 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 my participants use, my colleagues, myself, is often strategies that are about um, about um, doing what needs to get done for you to be recognized as a proper academic. So, you know, publish in some of the right places or or write in some of the right ways. And then along, and alongside that, try to do the, the feminist things, you know, so that in a sense, you, you tick the neoliberal boxes enough to create the space. And then once you create the space, you use the space to do radical transformative things. And I think uh, this is a strategy that can objectively yield many benefits. I mean, it is true, that was my own personal trajectory, getting published in the right journals got me jobs and then now in those jobs I can redistribute resources, you know, connect with people, radically transform things. But I sort of had to play the game, so to speak, in order to create the space, at least in British academia. And I think that's different from country to country. The possibilities of entering. I had to leave Portugal because this this strategy is not possible in Portugal because there are less openings into Portuguese academia. So I don't think these strategies are equally possible everywhere. Certainly, I know Germany is, is a place where there are many closures um, in, in that regard. Uh, so, but I think what I notice in my participants and in myself is because many of us see this as a sort of strategic intervention. I play the game, but I am not the game. I am separate from the game. So now I'm playing the neoliberal game, but my real investments are these other feminist radical ones. And what I notice in myself and in others over time is that the, the boundary between the playing of the game and who you are gradually becomes blurred. And many authors have analyzed how 
we come to internalize some of these neoliberal dynamics, where we come to get annoyed at ourselves for not working as hard as we had planned or for not completing everything we wanted to do. And what I started to notice in Portugal and also here in the UK is in, in other countries, uh, I, I hear reports of that as well, is that the, the, the playing of the game takes up levels of time and energy that produce forms of collective exhaustion, collective alienation, that then mean that there is very little left sometimes to do those other things. So, for example, what I notice is that is uh, uh, colleagues are so overwhelmed and so tired in the act of playing the game for survival that then they have to say no to things like, you know, uh, mentoring or, or peer reviewing other people's work or, or going to events, right? And I think many of you will recognize that feeling of all the people you wish you've spoken to and all the things you would like to do in a feminist community, but you don't do because you don't have time or you're too tired. And so I think there's something very complex here about the ways in which uh, we have ambitious strategies about juggling a thousand things that then come against the actual limitations of the energies of our bodies, of our minds. And in that encounter between our political ambitions, our intellectual ambitions, and our, our capacities, our physical, psychological capacities, um, there are forms of withdrawal. You know, I, I'm too overwhelmed. I can't do all of this. I have to say no. And saying no has become quite a thing that you hear feminists say. So my feminist colleagues say, oh, you smile too much. Uh, and then the students come and talk to you too much. Don't smile so much or say no. I keep this here by my desk. One of my colleagues made me a dice that says no on five sides and maybe on the other side. And because she says, oh, feminists do too much emotional labor, say no. And it sounds wonderful when you start doing it. But then when many of us individually, it works as a strategy. But collectively, what happens when a whole community starts using withdrawal, self-care understood in a certain way or saying no in a field that actually because it's so precarious it requires a lot of selfless yeses to function right so so there's a clash here between what are the individual strategies and what are the, co the collective effects of those strategies and if i can just say something very quickly in relation to the second question that connects with this is i've been really shocked and saddened by how neoliberalism as an individualizing force and Bidiana Kazic I think is really wonderful in writing about this um, that and she talks about an ethics of disconnection right that sometimes comes from a place of tiredness it's not just being mean or narcissistic sometimes you're just so tired right but this ethics of disconnection I think what I've been really interested to see is how it has seeped into at least in some feminist context the concepts that we use and the values that we have. So in the Anglo world, in the UK, in America, when you hear feminists talking about self-care, namely black feminists, a lot of the focus is on, I protect my boundaries. I don't want to do as much emotional labor. It's not my job to educate, educate you. So it's a, a withdrawal from the collective as a radical practice of self-care that is important. But then what I really have been very inspired by is when you look at feminist movements that have not been so entangled by these neoliberal logics. I mean, I was recently in an event with um, some Portuguese black feminists where they were suggesting a definition of self-care that is completely different, that is about my responsibility to my collective, that I have to take care of myself, my ego, my narcissism, uh, so that I don't project my ego onto the movement and the cause and the community so I can better take care of, of movement. And this is very different from an individualizing approach to self-care. So I think uh, the part, uh, Anna, I think it was Anna who uh, sent us that question. I think it's often in the bridges with feminist activism that we can find a place to reconnect with some of that, our concepts away from this ethics of disconnection of neoliberalism that is very prevalent in academia and maybe, although prevalent in ac activism as well, maybe less prevalent. I mean, I think that that this kind of um, neoliberal 
ethics, if I use the term of Liliana Kasic, ethics of disconnection and how we deal with that is, as you said, Maria, and works out quite differently in different uh, contexts. Um, I know that um, at least some, some of the scholars I know in Poland, they follow this strategy you, you have described, like following, and, and Poland has um, established enormously this kind of auditing practices. And so what they do is publishing as much as they can to secure their position. And um, some of them, but not so many, but some of them, they also go abroad and look for positions abroad. Uh, I mean, um, the university I am working in in Sweden is quite special in that respect because we have a link to the university. It's not part of the university. It's a we have a Baltic and East European Research Foundation. So we we are kind of a hoop for scholars from Eastern Europe and and graduate students. And of course, there are many. Uh, who apply for jobs there. And so this is one of the strategies. Poland as such has, and I mean, the link between academia and feminist, um, and the feminist and women's movement was very strong there, also in the last decades, because it was like really interchanged. It was not this kind that there was this, um, institutionalization of gender studies as a later step of a feminist movement, but there was a, those who were feminist scholars were at the same time activists. And in Poland, it's, it's so contradictory because you have this, um, enor you had had this enormous mobilization waves in the last years against like the abortion law and uh, others. And this was always an intersection of scholars and movement and norm. How this will continue? I mean, it's very difficult to say. Um, right now, the country is in such a very nationalist grip. If this would change, um, I don't think that um, it, they will be able to dismantle gender studies. I don't think so. but. This sets enormous pressure on uh, on scholars, and what I have heard is that there is also a kind of a gap between, which we also know from the Western countries, a kind of generational gap uh, from the more younger the more younger scholars and those who have been um, in the in in this movement like since the late 80s and early 90s so this there seems to be um, some tensions growing there around this and i don't really know uh, there are probably other scholars who could tell you more who know more details about the situation in poland i mean sweden has so far been in a way in some way privileged because they have not followed the the auditing thing so hard with publication numbers and all this, they have not. They have established a kind of governing strategies, which for instance, for German professors would be unacceptable. <laughs> okay. Uh, so where you really um, define within the um, uh, research national research foundation pretty few teams and um, uh, themes which you can apply money for so there is things which i experience sometimes where i think oh this really limits academic freedom from the side of the government okay so you have this kind of um, yeah so i think it's really contradictory and i would really agree with you 
Maria, that there is a great complexity in the processes going on and we should not too hastily define this, what's going on clearly as this is appropriation, this is, you know, uh, neoliberal feminists uh, and dismiss it at once. I think it's really very complex uh, what's going on uh, also in Germany. Thank you very much to both of you for the insights on, let's say, your the personal strategies, but also like uh, what you know about the different political and um, universal systems. So um, we have one more question from the audience that fits perfectly with uh, what both of you have been saying about uh, complexity. So um, there's one question that is uh, made by Anja Heise von der Lippe, and that also mentioned that, uh, thank you very much, that was very interesting. And um, I'm really impressed by the case for complexity you're making, she says. Um, her question would be, if you have any thoughts on how to confront the often conflating, extremely simplifying criticism of feminism from this point of complexity. My impression is that we often have to start at zero when defending the, necessi the necessity of feminist work in and out of academic context and don't even get to make the case for complexity. So maybe uh, again, both of you, so maybe Maria, you could start again and then Teresa uh, discuss this question. Thank you. I, uh, I think that's such an interesting, important question. And, um, and here I think my my training sort of becomes evident again. Um, I'm really realizing as I age that certain things that happen to you in your formative years stick with you forever, and uh, you start feeling old as uh, as those things maybe come out of fashion, um, <laughs> theoretically and politically. Uh, Theresa, I can see you you identify as well. I'm not calling you old, of course, but uh, uh, I am old. <laughs> I I see. I think. In those moments, you know, I would usually say discourse, discourse analysis, post structuralist ideas about discourse are not good for everything. There's many things that they're not very good for. But I think that's an area where I really think there's something to the to, to offer there. One of the things I know I in, in, in my own work, so when I was studying how academics demarcate the boundaries of proper knowledge and negotiate it, at one point I made an argument that was a sort of very small thing that I never really did very much with that I've thought more about, which is that I say at one point that I think but, but many of the academic systems that we're fighting or trying to get into, however you want to describe it, they are complex and sometimes quite contradictory systems. So I mentioned the Portuguese system that still has some of that old feudalism, sexism, but is also at the same time neoliberal and meritocratic and open. And it's both those things at the same time. And, and, I, and I argue that the thing we're fighting against or trying to change it's a very complex, slippery thing, and I think for us to fight it, and, and the way that it that it works, this thing that we're trying to uh, dismantle, it it's I I always say to my students often give the example of buildings that are built for earthquakes. When when you you're building a system that is subjected to shocks, you don't build a rigid a rigid building. You build a building that can bend and absorb the shock. And I think the patriarchy colonialism, you know, cis heteronormativity, whatever we're fighting, these are systems that are built to absorb shocks and they adapt and they bend and they're flexible. And so and 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 so I think our own strategies have to be have to bend and be flexible and be adaptable. So so I've often so I think sometimes a problem with our strategies is that because we understandably have have a lot have had a lot of internal debates in feminism about um you know not wanting to reproduce certain stereotypes or certain inequalities i think we become invested in these ideas that there is one way to speak about an issue and one strategy and we apply it and then of course it sometimes we don't even get that strategy to to be heard because it is not intelligible in a certain place and and so one thing I defend uh, I propose in my book is that we have to be better at what I call reflexive epistemography. It's such a horrible name. It's like please uh, put it out of your mind. Basically, what I'm trying to say, epistemography is 
the, the capacity to draw maps and, and reflexive and flexible, because I think in different places that we go to, in different situations of negotiation, I think we have to adapt our discourse and our strategies to what is intelligible and possible in those spaces in a way that is still reflexive and accountable. I don't think we can say racist things or transphobic things just in order to be taken seriously. I think there has to be accountability and reflexivity, but I think we have to be a lot better at understanding, okay, what works discursively in this context and how are we going to intervene here? And maybe the intervention here is different from the intervention over there. And Julian Honkasalo, who I cited earlier, was actually calling for something that I'm really persuaded by. Julian was saying, in every single gender studies program, we should have a module that is purely about teaching argumentation strategies, you know, discourse strategies, how you take a discourse and you dismantle it and you play with it. And that's that's an exercise in translation and in discourse. It's a practical exercise. It's not just a political, and not just an exercise in political virtue and intellectual capacity. It's an exercise in uh, and translating and connecting and dialogue and argumentation. So I think that's something we need maybe to, to have more conversations about the practicalities of how we debate, because we have to debate slightly differently in different places, because otherwise, as you say, we don't even get heard. I mean, this is, as Maria said, it's a very complex uh, situation. What, in a way, has happened, because Sweden has this kind of being the model and being said that uh, we have uh, and was supported actually the 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 uh, um, institutionalization of women's studies as it was called was very early on supported uh, by the government and it was uh, linked closely linked to gender equality policies uh, then then you have so to speak the 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 so the, the, there was not a zero point and you have a structure which is quite well established but what was a really deep challenge in sweden was uh when the kind of post-colonial and decolonial perspective entered the area and scholars from uh, um, which were not bio-Swedish entered the agenda and questioned many of what has been taken as um, exemplary, you know, and this has been an enormous, I, I would say that the challenge there has been even bigger and, than the challenge of post-colonial and intersectional perspective uh, in Sweden and because you have a very special system where knowledge production is also closely linked to policy making you have this kind of inquiry committees which are part of policy making and which are visible part of policy making to a much larger degree than this is the case um, in germany and so you had scholars who were part of this inquiry committees and questioned the Swedish policies and called them structural ra racism. And this led to a lot of conflicts. So, and also frictions, which still continue. Uh, this is, so to speak, the Swedish situation, how to <laughs> create solidarity, how to, which is, um, I would say, um, even the frictions are maybe, I would, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, quite strong uh, because this understanding of itself as being so good, what's so strong? In Germany, as somebody who has, so to speak, been socialized into the, the, the critical, criticize, criticize, criticize style, which, uh, nobody would call the politics good it was only criticism so the situation is a very different one okay 